Well, welcome to Equality Witnesses. My name is Robert Pears. In this episode, we're going to talk about the price for revival with insight from Duncan Campbell. He, of course, was a key leader in the Hebrides revival in the middle of the last century. That revival, of course, saw God move powerfully in those islands just off the Scottish coast. As I look at that revival, it really emphasizes that revival is a divine assault on society that changes everything. And as we look at today, we see all the needs, we see all the problems, all the chaos, and everything that's going on. And we need a revival. We need a divine assault on society, but it must start with us first. And it must start with us recognizing who we are in Christ. Um, Duncan Campbell said this, a Christian is a supernatural being who has had a supernatural experience. And that is, and there's something more than singing choruses. That is something more than being a member of a church. That is something more than enjoying conventions. It's God being the center. And I really want to emphasize that because it's got to start with us. The word is very clear that we must return. And that means God must become the center. The Lord must become Jesus. I mean, Jesus must become the Lord of our lives once again. He must be the center, the focus of everything we do, say, and think. Revival starts with us. We need to realize who we are and step up to the plate and become real Christians in this hour. He said this, you can allow the Holy Spirit to reveal Christ, oh, that His glorious personality is incorporated into your being. And he was explaining that, you know what? You cannot make yourself a better person, but the Holy Spirit can come in and so radically change you and make you a witness so that the world sees. What a phenomenal thing in this hour for the world to truly see Christians changed by the hand of God. That's a witness that God is still on the throne, that Jesus is Lord. He said, away, he said this, Away with your milk and water preaching of the love of Christ that has no holiness or moral discrimination in it. Away with the preaching of a Christ not crucified for our sin. Listen, we've got to realize right now that we don't need another inspirational word. We don't need another inspirational speaker. We need true men and women of God stepping up to the plate and preaching the power of the cross because that's what changes lives. We need to realize that in our own lives so that we are witnesses of it. And many of us have not truly experienced it. And we walk through life struggling instead of experiencing the power of the cross to change us, to set us free. Because where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And the Word should be so radically changing you that you are a living witness that Jesus is Lord. Is the church we know today a light that marks the road that leads men to the cross? Our lives and everything we do as a church should show the power of the cross and be a bright light shining and drawing people to it. It has to mean something. But instead, people look at it and they see religion as something dead and of no value to them. Why? Because most Christians are dead. They need revived. They need changed. Men and them aren't even truly Christians. They go to a church and they do all these things but they don't know Him, and they don't know the power of the cross because we've not had true preaching in the pulpit, life-changing preaching. Duncan Campbell then went on to explain this. We have a covenant-keeping God. You know, why can we trust that God will move again in a powerful revival? Because God is a covenant-keeping God. He said this, I believe He's a covenant-keeping God. I read in the word that they that hunger shall be satisfied. I'm going to come back to that point. He said, you made a promise. And I want to remind you that we believe that you were a covenant keeping God. Your honor is at stake. You have to revive us again because your honor is at stake. Hallelujah. But it starts with you and me. And we need to walk right with our God. It is one thing to talk about revivals, but give me a people on their faces seeking to be rightly related with God, and when that happens, we will soon see the impact of God. We need to stop being people that talk about it 
and start being people that do something about it. I don't know if you ever watched Shark Tank or shows like that. And you see entrepreneurs and you see them sometimes getting criticized by the Shark Tank because they have this big dream, but that's all it is. And you see them honor those that have dared to pay the price to see their baby birthed. And we need to dare to pay the price to get our faces on the ground and seek God and say, God, change me first. I want to walk right, humbly, holy before you. We live in an hour where holiness is cast aside. But I want to remind you that it's the Holy Spirit, the Holy, underlined Holy Spirit. And if He is moving, and remember the church was birthed by Him, we're supposed to be filled by Him, walking in and by the Holy Spirit, then guess what? We should be progressively becoming more and more holy and not more and more like the world. There should be a separation. God is a God of power, and He will find a willing people in the day of His power. And of course, he was quoting from Psalm 110. And we are on the verge of the greatest day of His power. God is going to move in a phenomenal way, and He's looking for a willing people. And the willing people are those that are on the ground seeking Him, crying out in the secret place. They're right now doing it. At the Hebrides Revival, before it was birthed, they've been praying and standing and seeking God because some of them were disturbed by what they saw. And it, we have got to be disturbed by what we see going on and it should cause us to want to see God move. And so they were disturbed, but they weren't seeing results. And one man said this, Brethren, it seems to me just so much sentiment humbug to be praying as we are praying, to be waiting as we are waiting, if we ourselves are not rightly related to Christ. What a phenomenal statement. If we are not walking right, if we do not have clean hands and a pure heart, how can we ascend the hill of the Lord? How can we expect to see the Holy Spirit move if we are not getting right with God first? The call is that we return to Him first. And in this hour, that's the price that we must pay. The secret of power is separation from all that is unclean. And for me, there's nothing so unclean as the liberal views held by some today, Duncan Campbell said. You know, we live in an hour where we're not recognizing what's going on and standing up for the principles of the Word. What does the Word say? Because, you know, the Word is eternally settled in heaven. And whether or not we like it, the Word must be final authority. And when the Word becomes final authority, it will start to have power in our lives. And then it'll start to have power in our churches and in our city. We must return to the Word and not a some politically correct uh, word that makes everybody feel good, but doesn't change them. Duncan Campbell then went on to say, we need to be hungry. Because, you know, we know that in nature, that nature abhors a vacuum. It has to fill it. And God abhors a need. He has to meet it. He wants us, when we're hungry and thirsty, to fill. That's His desire. And He's longing for us to cry out that He may fill us. And so Duncan Campbell said this, We know, um, let me assure you, you have a need, uh, sorry, a sense of need, that you need to have this need. You need to recognize it. And I think one of the things in this hour is we are so satisfied with so many things that we don't recognize that we are naked, that we need God. We become the lad of city and church, and we become comfortable and happy. But I want to warn you that God is shaking every foundation, as He has done before every revival, to bring the church back to the place where they have to recognize we need Him. He went on to explain that we need His anointing because it's the anointing of God that changes everything. Duncan Campbell said the early church cried for unction and not for entertainment because they knew that unction creates interest and real soul concern. It's the anointing that changes things, not entertainment, not inspirational words. It's the Holy Ghost anointed powerful words. And that's what we need back in our pulpits. That's what we need back in our lives. It's the anointing. He said, how did the early church get people? 
by publicity projects, by bills, by posters, by parades, by, by uh, pictures? No. The people were arrested and drawn together and brought into a vital relationship with God, um, not with sounds from men, but sounds from heaven. We are in need of more sounds from heaven. We need the Holy Ghost to pour in and pour through us. We need that anointing. Here I would suggest that one of the main secrets of the successes in the early church lay in the fact that the early believers believed in unction from on high, not entertainment from men. They understood they needed the Holy Ghost. We need to stand on the promises. You know, as we look at the Hebrides revival, it was marked by certain key people, and there were two elderly sisters that would gather three nights a week and pray, standing on one promise. You know, we look at all the problems and the situations going on in the world, and it seems so great and so big, but we just need one word from heaven. One word from heaven would change everything. We need one promise. We stand on one promise. There's enough life in that one promise to change everything. And they knew it, and they did it, and it's a testimony. It is part of the cloud of witnesses that speaks to us and challenges us today. If they can do it, so can we, because we have the same Holy Spirit. And Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And God it doesn't change. There's no shadow of a change in Him. That brought Duncan Campbell to a place where we need to understand that we need to have a confidence in prayer. Now I want you to get this. He said, I have known that young woman to pray heaven into a community, to pray power into a meeting. He understood that it had to be prayed in because remember we're told in the Our Father, we're to pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on the earth. So God wants to work with us to pray something on the earth. We have a responsibility to lay hold of the will and purpose of heaven and see it birthed on the earth. If we're going to see revival, we've got to be the people praying in, standing on the word. He said this, how they longed and how they prayed and how they waited and how they cried. Oh God, rend the heavens and come down. And all the time God was dealing with them and the process of cleansing them went on until the moment came when the angels and archangels looked over the battlements of glory uh, and cried, God, the vessels are clean, the miracle can happen. And we've got to have such a confidence to hold fast and hold fast because we're in a season where God is working on us. But the promise will not fail because God said that he's not a man that he should lie. And he's also said that he watches over his word to perform it. And all of his promises are yes and amen. He went on to say, you find two elderly sisters on their face before the peat fire three nights a week, pleading one promise. I say one promise. I will pour up water upon them that are thirsty and floods upon the dry grounds. That was the promise they stood on. And God met them. And God honored that pleading and standing. There is a place beyond consecration. There is a place beyond sanctification. And that is the place of implicit confidence in God. That God, what you've said, you will do. All oh, that we would come to that in this hour. He then would say, God wants to bless us and revive us. We got to understand this. You know, you see the... Um, man come to Jesus and asked to be healed. And he said, if you are willing. So he had to understand that God could, but not if God would. And I think many of us in this hour believe that God can revive us, but we're not sure that God wants to and wills it. We've got to get into the Word. And he shared this here, talking about um, the, the, the widower and her son, and Elijah that came, and of course the oil that would su supplied and, and filled all the jugs. And he talked about that. There came a moment when the supply of oil stopped, not because the source had dried up, but because the capacity to receive what was flowing at that moment failed. So the thing that stopped the flow was they ran out of jugs. 
Not that God didn't want to stop pouring out. And I think we look at every revival and there comes a point in time where we stop being able to receive. And God wants to continue to pour out. And God wants them so move and fill us to overflowing continuously. God never wants to stop. It seems to me that the simple truth that we have here is that God wills to give himself. He wills to give himself again and again and again, so long as we keep bringing that into which he can pour himself. So we will keep emptying ourselves of ourselves. If we'll keep hungry and crying out for him, he will fill it. And there comes a point where we've got to stop becoming complacent and stop losing that hunger. May that hunger grow in us. May we become more hungry for him, more desperate for him. He said, God has promised and God will fulfill his promise. God is a God of revival and he will revive us again. Amen. Now, I want to get this final purpose or point was that there has to be a burden for souls. You have to see what's going on and it has to disturb you. It has to cause you to go into action based on the word living in you. God so loved the whole world that he gave. It caused him to do something. And that love of God in us should drive us to do something. And he said, suddenly a cry is heard within. A young man burdened for souls of his fellow man is pouring out his soul in intercession. He falls into a trance and lies prostrate on the floor of the church. That the people in the midst of the revival, before the revival, were burdened for souls that it would so consume them that they had to cry out and be so consumed by the Holy Ghost. He said, but heaven is heard and the congregation moved by the power of God comes back into the church and a wave of conviction sweeps over the gathering, moving strong men to cry for mercy. As I've shared, revival is a divine assault in society. I don't care how strong, how stubborn you are. When the Spirit of God moves, He can touch and break the heart of any man. He went on to say, weeping and sorrow and distress, others with joy and love filling their hearts, falling on their knees, conscious only of the power of God who had come in reviving blessing. That all they saw, all they could be consumed about was the power of God, which was so touching them, either convicting them or causing such a joy to arise in them. That's revival, and we need it in this hour. It is not true that so is it not true that often faint hardness creeps over us and accordingly there springs up an unwillingness to make a strenuous effort towards revival? And I'm going to finish with that. Are we willing to pay the price for revival? To keep praying, but I haven't seen to keep praying. And in that season that we're in right now, allow the Holy Ghost to change and transform us. He's got to become real to us, not in some weird mystical way, but through the word and through prayer that he becomes a person with us, that changes us and transforms us and takes the word and causes us to bear fruit in us and through us, that we truly will be a witness in this hour. Revival must start with us. Amen. Well, I pray that you would join us in praying daily for revival. Check us out on Facebook and stand with us because God is about to move. We're about to see the greatest global awakening that the church has ever seen. And this world is about to experience a divine assault. Amen. Thank you and be blessed.